Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden, and today we're going to look into the case of Jonathan Luna. This is a case from back in uh, December of 2003. And, you know, there's so many questions I have swirling through my head. Um, one of the big ones is I'm wondering if law enforcement and the FBI, if they're actually really trying to solve this case or if everyone would just rather it went away. Yeah, it's, it's that kind of mystery. Uh, let's jump into it and get started right away. Here's a picture of Jonathan Luna. Um, you can see he's a nice looking young guy. We're going to start with what I always consider the popular version of the truth, uh, Wikipedia. Jonathan P. Luna, October 21st, 1965 to December 4th of 2003, was a Baltimore-based assistant United States attorney who was stabbed 36 times with his own penknife and found drowned in a creek in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Luna grew up in the projects in the South Bronx near Yankee Stadium. Apparently he is a lifelong uh, Yankees fan. He was of African-American and Filipino ancestry. Uh, from what I understand, his father is Filipino and his mother is African-American. He was a graduate of Fordham University and the law school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He was married to an obstetrician and had two children. He was 38 years old when he died. And as you can see, a large chunk of this article is about the night that he died, but we're going to take it in pieces from news sources. So one of the first questions I had when I looked into this case is what the heck is a pen knife? Uh, apparently, according to Wikipedia, it is a British-English term for a small folding knife, and you can see they have a picture of a pen knife over there. Um, apparently, a Swiss Army knife can also be considered the same type of knife. Um, the thing that strikes me about these knives is I believe usually knives of this size do not have a locking blade. Um, so if you are trying to actually stab something with it, there's a very good chance that the knife could fold and actually wind up uh, cutting your hands or cutting your fingers as well. Um, jumping over to the Washington Post, um, this is a picture of a small creek in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and this is where uh, Jonathan Luna was found. This is one of the only photos that I've seen of the actual location of where he was found. As you can see, there's some minor coverage. Uh, might be pretty easy to be hidden in there, but uh, he was found rather quickly. So let's get some more details about how that came about. On December 4th, 2003 at 5 a.m., Daniel Gemmon arrived at his job as a driller at Sensenig and Weaver well drilling in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the heart of Amish country. After parking his truck on the side of the building near Woods off Dry Tavern Road, he punched in, made coffee, and headed outside to fill the company's six trucks with fuel for the day. A tiny red light near the woods caught his eye. A co-worker had shown up and the pair wandered over. A closer look revealed that the light was on the dashboard of a four-door silver Honda Accord. Its front wheels teetered on a creek's four-foot-high bank. Gemmon saw a spattering of blood on the front seat where was the driver? Apparently the car was still on. It was actually idling and the headlights were also on in the vehicle. Um, and blood, it gets a little tricky. There's several different accounts on what's going on with the blood. The most popular version of the story is there was a large pool of blood actually in the back seat. And in the back seat, it was also noted there was a, um, a baby seat back there, a baby car seat. Um, so a large pool of blood in the back seat and then also on the driver's side door and on, front, on the front fender, it looked like there was blood smeared across those as well. Now the Washington Post has a bit of an explanation for that pool of blood being in the back seat that's a little different from most of the sources I've read on this, but let's see what they say here. Pennsylvania State Police Troopers James Fastnacht and Keith Knoll arrived first. Fastnack noticed blood on the driver's door and a fender and a large pool of blood in the back. The blood had seeped through the front seat to the floor in the rear. Now, I don't know where exactly that fact is coming from. This article isn't really citing a direct source for that, but I can tell you that it's a little bit of a point of contention because most 
quote experts or authors that have written about this that look into this note that the blood in the back seat does not make logical sense um, for one of the theories that is kicked around on this which is that he actually inflicted the wounds himself while he was in the driver's seat however this Washington Post article and this is the only place where I've seen this has this link between the front seat and the pool of blood in the back seat so um, it's a bit tricky because if you're considering that maybe he was abducted by someone and taken in his car um, it could be that they had already hurt him and put him in the back seat and that's why he was bleeding and creating this pool of blood um, so that is one of the kind of popular theories in terms of him potentially being murdered versus harming himself but let's continue and see what other details shake out of this uh, cash about two hundred dollars was scattered about and they're they're talking about the interior of the car the Honda's engine was idling but there was nothing to indicate the car had been in an accident so we know a little bit about him we know what his job was we know he was supposedly stabbed 36 times by his own pen knife by the way that pen knife was not found at the scene uh, when police processed it, they searched the area. They could not find whatever weapon was used. I believe it was two months later that uh, someone went back to the area and found the pen knife. Just a little suspicious, but I guess that's how it actually happened. Um, outside of all that, what happened to the time in between here? There is a very good timeline that has been put together. I think this is actually course material uh, for a class at Penn State U online but um, you can see they've done this case study here this uh, organization called Fearson Associates and they have a really good timeline of what happened the day that uh, this tragedy struck so let's just go through that together real quick Wednesday the 3rd of December in the morning um, he was fined $25 by the judge for being late to court Luna says that he was at a hospital all night with his infant son 6 p.m he had reached a plea agreement on a case now the the case he was working on involved two guys that were uh, rap artists that were also selling heroin and apparently one of those guys murdered someone in a drug related sale um, that case ultimately both of those guys got much less time than they probably should have because of this plea agreement so I know when I started looking into this the first thing I thought was okay these guys might have some reason to harm him when you actually look at how the case was unfolding they probably wouldn't have wanted him harmed because he was essentially going to give them a, a plea deal that would give them much less time than they were facing if they were being fully prosecuted now there is some question around what what happened with this case that I think might lead to a potential motive for someone else harming him in some way we'll get to that by the end of the video but let's continue uh, after 6 p.m. Luna goes home at 8:48 p.m. it says that he returns to the office to draw up plea agreement but if you can see after that they're putting question marks about him being at the office at 906 and 930 at 906 he spoke to an attorney for one of the guys that he was working this plea agreement out for um, and Luna told him he had to go home and would be back in his office in the federal courthouse in Baltimore later at 9.30, he leaves a voicemail message on a different attorney's phone saying that he would fax over the plea agreement when he was done creating it. Uh, at 10.30, defendant's attorney says he talked to Luna at about 10.30 and expected the fax before midnight. It never arrived. Now, at Luna's home around 11, he receives a phone call and tells his wife that he has to go to the office. The big question I have is, even in this area where was he really because according to one news story that I read on this his wife says that he was home that night until he got this phone call at 11 is it possible that he had an office at home that he was working on I did see some mention that he had a laptop maybe he had his laptop with him at home and that's where he was uh, doing this and placing these phone calls to these guys so I don't know if this timeline is exactly right about him bouncing back and forth I've seen two different distances for how far he lived from the courthouse to his home so one of them said it was 10 miles the other said it was 14 if he made that trip twice I mean that's burning up a lot of time I don't quite think that that's probably how someone like this would have operated so my feeling 
and that's that's all that it is unfortunately there's no way to really boil this down is that he was probably home until that phone call happened around 11 at night that his wife noted and then he left after 11 he departs for the office at 11:38, they note that his car leaves the parking garage um, which is really interesting to me. I've heard that this is actually video footage that was captured of his car leaving, but I'm not sure why they didn't have his car showing up. Once again, we, we already have this weird stuff going on with this time frame where it just, it doesn't feel complete to me. I'm not sure that the details are being fully released to us. As a matter of fact, we know they're not. We know that some of the authorities working on this case, even still to this day, say that it's active and there is stuff that they're not releasing. However, if you are going to release parts of a timeline like this, I don't know why you wouldn't fill that in and also note, hey, we know that he showed up at, you know, 1110 or, or something along those lines, but just a start to the strangeness of this case. Uh, either way, we know that he leaves at least his car leaves the parking garage at 11.38. Now what's also interesting about that is apparently he left his glasses, his laptop, and that cell phone that I mentioned in his office. And he needed his glasses for driving. So that starts raising questions for a lot of people that look into this case. Uh, did he, first of all, this phone call that happened at 11 at his home, once again, this only happened in 2003. Uh, where are the phone records? We could figure out who placed that phone call relatively easily. That information is nowhere to be found, at least from what I was able to dig up. So someone calls him. It prompts him to go to the office. Do we know if he met someone there? Um, you would think that this is, you know, this is a federal building. There should be some pretty good security here. According to some info I've heard, it's not the case that, um, that there was really good security at this building. I kind of question that because this is only two years after 9-11. And if you guys remember what happened around 9-11, it was nutty in terms of everyone really focusing on security. And in particular, for a federal building after what happened at 9-11, I find it extremely hard to believe that there wasn't some form of at least cameras, let alone some type of check-in at a front desk. Um, I know when you go to courthouses nowadays, I mean, you got metal detectors, security guards all over the place. It's very strange to me that none of that information is shaking out in this case, but it doesn't seem to be there. At 11.49, his car passes Fort McHenry Tunnel Toll Plaza northbound on the I-95. At midnight, um, we've got the lawyer that is waiting to get his fax of the plea agreement, but it never arrives. At 12.28, Luna's car passes through Perryville Toll Plaza northbound. Um, so we can see he's going on this drive where he's crossing state lines even. I'm not sure why. 12.46, his car passes through a toll plaza northbound. Uh, that's in Delaware. Uh, 12.57, his card was used for a $200 ATM withdrawal from Exxon at a travel plaza. And if you recall those details from the Washington Post article, there was $200 in loose cash kind of blown around the inside of the car. So perhaps that's where it came from. They're noting here at 1.45 a.m., that is the earliest time that his car could have entered the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Um, but at 2.37 a.m. approximately, his car enters the New Jersey Turnpike at Interchange 6A from New Jersey Route 130. Uh, 247 a.m. King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. His car enters the Pennsylvania Turnpike at Interchange 359, the Delaware River Bridge. Uh, and apparently this route that he's taking is not direct, especially for where he wound up. It really looks like, I don't know if, if he was alone, if he was maybe distressed in some way, maybe he was trying to clear his head and he wasn't really thinking about where he was driving in particular. I'm really not sure. 3.20 a.m. in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. His debit card was used at a Sunoco station to buy gas and possibly for another ATM withdrawal. Uh, 3.30 a.m., a Roy Rogers restaurant manager at a rest stop says that she saw Luna, but the FBI investigators doubt this. 4.04, his car exited Pennsylvania Turnpike at exit 286. A paper ticket with blood spot, and I have seen reports that they said it was specifically his blood, uh, was turned into the toll collector even though Luna's car has easy pass. 
And that's part of the mystery to this as well. Apparently on all these tolls that he's going through, he only used the easy pass on the first few. And then for some reason, after I think the ATM withdrawal, he switched to buying tolls and using cash. Um, that leads some people to believe that perhaps he could have been driving for the first part of the drive while someone was instructing him, telling him what to do. Then maybe they hurt him, put him in the back, and they took over driving, and they didn't know about the easy pass system, so they started stopping at the tolls. What I'm curious about is, and I don't know if, there, if these are automated tolls in this part of the country. I really have not driven in this part of the country at all. Um, but most toll booths that I go through, you actually have someone well, there's, there's two types. There is the type where occasionally they're automated. You slide a card in or you slide money in and then it flips open. But a lot of them that I've experienced actually have an operator. And this line that we just read specifically mentions a toll booth operator. Um, I'm very curious about the fact why one of these newspapers or investigators uh, has not released information about one of these toll booth operators saying, hey, uh, yeah, I saw the guy in the car. He was in there alone. I mean, it could literally be that simple and this would not be an interesting case in the least. But instead of that, um, we still have all these questions and just absolutely no clarity here. Uh, also, I believe a lot of these toll booth areas should have some form of video surveillance. And once again, it seems like we are just not getting clear information about what's going on in this car. Just a very clear path of where it's going. After 4.05 in Denver, Pennsylvania, Luna was alive when his car entered the parking lot and pulled up to the creek, according to the coroner. 5.30 a.m., his car was discovered in the parking lot and his body subsequently was found in the creek. Uh, at 9.30, he was due in court. Now, here's something extremely interesting. After 9.30, at a shopping mall in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Luna's credit card is used at a King of Prussia, Pennsylvania shopping mall hours after his body was discovered. Now we know at a minimum he did drive through that area. Is it possible that he lost that card along the way? Someone picked it up and tried to use it? It's certainly possible. There is also the potential that he actually stopped at that area. You have the Roy Rogers restaurant manager saying that she specifically saw him and she was very certain that it was him. But like we said, the investigators doubt this. They doubt this because of the time it would take to drive from there to the next checkpoint where they know his car was. So um, I don't know, a lot of questions, but it certainly looks kind of suspicious to me that his card is used after that. However, if you do go down the line of thinking that this is someone that harmed him and then took his credit card and tried to use it later, why didn't that guy also take the money that was loose in the car um, apparently his wallet was still with him um, that had other credit cards in it. There's a lot of questions around this where I look at some of these things and I say, okay, it looks like there might be someone else involved here, but then when you actually boil down the logic of it, it kind of pushes me back and says, well, but it also could be just him on his own. And um, But this is a really interesting twist because how do you explain this where his credit card's getting used somewhere else? There is another case study file uh, done by Fearson Associates. It's kind of written in long form. Um, quite honestly, if you only review one thing in the d details down below, uh, I highly recommend that it's this document. And I'll have links to both of these down there, the timeline, but also their written out analysis on it. Um, it's very strong. I think it pretty much encompasses everything you're gonna find across all of the different news articles. And there's even an article from the Baltimore Sun that is um, from December 5th, 2003. It's literally reporting on the event uh, just a day after it happened. Um, this is where I saw the information from his wife that makes it seem like he was home that night until the phone call around 11. I also bumped into this interesting tidbit. Lancaster County Coroner Barry D. Walp said last night that Luna also had been shot. He declined to say what the cause of death was. Now, everything else I'm reading says it was only the stab wounds. It was 36 stab wounds in particular. Um, there seems to be some debate of was there hesitation wounds. Uh, in case you don't know what those are, sometimes if someone's trying to hurt themselves, they will start doing it uh, with kind of very soft or not quite as hard 
uh, and that is a much more shallow wound. And then as they work up the courage or the frustration or whatever angst they're going through, the wounds get deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, we basically have one coroner saying that, yeah, he noted there were some hesitation wounds. We have another one that says, no, they weren't hesitation wounds. Um, the official cause of death is actually drowning. So he was stabbed 36 times by a relatively small knife, um, although apparently one of those did strike an artery, and he probably only had minutes to live just from that wound. But despite that, somehow he winds up in the water and drowns before he actually dies from uh, the blood running out of him. So, uh, But I can find no other information about a gunshot wound. I think this was just kind of an early analysis that happened in the case. Jumping over to an article um, only from a couple days after that in 2003, December 8th, uh, at CNN.com, prosecutor's dad believes killing linked to job. Paul Luna said FBI agents had interviewed him about his son's life. Paul Luna said that he thinks the killing was job related and that he repeatedly talked to his son about the dangers of his job. Um, keep in mind, this guy was trying very hardened criminals and putting them away. So. Um, he certainly was not making any friends doing the type of work that he was doing, at least from that side of the courtroom. Uh, and there is some information out there that perhaps his boss wasn't very happy with him. Uh, it seems like he might have even been looking into hiring an attorney to represent himself um, in some type of, I don't know if they were going to try to fire him or something along those lines. That's kind of what's alluded to. Some of these articles write very directly about that. Other articles say, no, there was nothing to that. So I don't know which way to go with it. Um, there was a little bit of an issue in another case that he had tried, which was about a bank robbery. And um, part of the evidence they brought in for that case was the money that was actually stolen. Apparently one bundle of that money disappeared and it's unsure where it went to. Now, after he was killed, a lot of speculation, or after he died, I guess is more appropriate, a lot of speculation started kicking around as the investigators started digging into his background. Um, they were saying he has a large amount of debt. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys, they're noting that he had like $25,000 in debt. For a person that is working in that type of position who has a wife that does her field of work, I don't know that I believe, even for 2003, that 25 grand is all that steep in terms of debt. What's a bit more interesting than that is he had credit cards that his wife didn't know about. However, I've seen relationships before where things get weird and sometimes spouses hide things like that from others. Uh, other information that came out around this are, is him potentially um, using some kind of internet dating sites. Um, it's, it's really weird because one of the authors that has written a book on this kind of pointed out that not only was he killed physically, it's like there was also a campaign to smear his name after the fact. And when you look at how all this information is coming out and how the, the real hard evidence type of information really isn't being presented, but then you're getting these super intimate personal details that are, it does strike a little bit of a chord with me of, is something going on here? Is this some type of smear campaign? It's, it's just really odd. It'd be one thing if um, there was some direct correlation between this stuff. And I think the newspapers have made a bit of an indirect correlation. They're trying to point out that the $36,000 that went missing and he stabbed himself 36 times. You know, was he stabbing himself for every thousand dollars? It just, I think that is a super weak correlation. And according to a podcast I listened to on this called Case File, which I kind of have mixed feelings about how they presented the info, uh, according to their research, the amount of money was actually more like $38,100. Of course, if you're writing an article on it, it doesn't sound as cool as, hey, he stabbed himself 36 times and there was $36,000. So I don't know if that's just kind of an urban legend aspect to this that is starting. Sources said Sunday that investigators had found messages on adult websites under Luna's name, which sought women for sexual encounters. Now, even there, I have a little bit of a strange alarm go off. Uh, is a guy this smart that has, you know, really risen from poverty, worked so hard to push out of that throughout his life, 
Um, is he going to be dumb enough to use his own name on those types of websites? I, I really don't know. Perhaps, but it just there's, there's a very strong question for me about the legitimacy of that. Would it be easy for someone else to start up websites or go to these websites and start up profiles under his name, maybe even using a picture of him? I think that would be extremely easy. Sources have said that the location where Luna's body was found is a place where people have been known to gather to seek other people for sexual encounters. Um, from what I heard, we're talking about the middle of Amish country in a bit of an industrial area where a drilling company works. I don't know that that really holds up for me logically. And outside of that, um, there are many articles that have been written in the years since this that um, basically are refuting that. They're saying, no, there is nothing to this area about there being some type of sexual business going on there. Jumping over to an article at Baltimore Sun, this is five years later, and they're saying the prosecutor's death is still a mystery. Top officials boldly promised to catch Luna's killer, and law enforcement officers worked diligently, certain they were hunting for someone who had killed one of their own. But the focus soon turned to Luna's personal troubles, with federal sources leaking details of the prosecutor's debts and job difficulties, along with unproven theories of affairs and stolen evidence to media hungry for answers. Luna had become a suspect in his own death. Over the next several years, reputations were sullied, investigations allegedly botched, and Senate inquiries made. A Pennsylvania private investigator has put forth hypotheses based on evidence he claims to have found implicating the FBI, and book authors suggested deadly federal informants were to blame, and now nothing. Five years after the case was opened, it's now gone cold. No one has been caught, no culprit has been identified. The FBI has even investigated itself, questioning an employee they said might have had a romantic link to Luna. That avenue caused problems for the agency, which was accused of mishandling the inquiry. A Department of Justice Inspector General report would later conclude that there was, quote, credible evidence of serious misconduct in the way the agency dealt with the internal probe. Shortly before the first anniversary of Luna's death, the Baltimore office of the FBI released a statement that Luna was alone from the time he had left his office until his body was found the next morning. Now, if the FBI is going to release a statement like that, I would love if they would produce some evidence. And just looking at this chain of check-ins that they have about his vehicle, him stopping at an ATM, which apparently the uh, video camera was not functional on the ATM, but uh, where the ATM was located, was there any other cameras available there? At any of these toll passes, were there cameras available there that might have caught what was going on inside the vehicle? Were there any employees that interacted with him at these toll booth passes? In my mind, it would have meant a completely different thing if the FBI would have actually released proof with this statement. But when they do something like this, um, you know, they just leave it for conspiracy theorists and other people to think that, hey, they're trying to smear this guy again, and now they're trying to tilt us towards the fact that he actually killed himself instead of someone doing this to him. Ed Martino, a Pennsylvania private investigator hired by a friend of the Luna family, spent months looking into Luna's death. He tried but failed to get the Lancaster County Coroner's Office to conduct an inquest. He too believes Luna's professional life should be the focus, especially his dealings with the FBI. He alleges the agency has shut down the case and that evidence such as Luna's car has disappeared. Through a spokesman, the FBI declined to comment on the case or Martino's allegations. Jumping over to abc27.com, um, I know I mentioned the book earlier, but I didn't get his name. William Keisling is the name of the author. Uh, William Keisling penned a book, The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna. Quote, it was a murder. It was clearly a murder. The guy had been viciously killed. The Lancaster County coroner at the time agreed and ruled the case a homicide. Few people at the time questioned that ruling, given that Luna was stabbed repeatedly. But a short time later, reports surfaced that the FBI was pressuring the coroner to change the ruling to suicide. Investigators said the weapon that inflicted the wounds was likely Luna's own penknife. Now, I do really have a bit of a problem with that being the murder weapon because if you have to assume if this was someone that was premeditating hurting him, 
were they really going to know that he was going to have this knife on him? And were, how were they going to get it from him? There's a lot of logistic problems to that logically. If someone's planning on hurting him, they're probably going to bring their own weapon. And that is a thing that's missing from this case, and it's a really hard ding for me to get around. Um, is this someone that wasn't intending on harming him that he went to meet with and they went for a drive together. Uh, Jonathan let him drive his car for some reason because like I mentioned, he didn't bring his glasses which he needed to drive. Uh, and then during that, there was some struggle with the pen knife. I don't know. Now, according to some information I've seen, another sample of blood um, not matching Jonathan was found in the car but there has been no information released about any potential DNA matches to that. There is also mention of a partial print not belonging, not belonging to Jonathan also being found in the car, but no real follow-up that I can see on that as well. Back to the author of the book, uh, quote, the police reports say there was a pool of blood in the rear passenger seat. So what are they saying? That a US attorney was driving across four states, stabbing himself in the back, cutting his throat. Luna was under investigation for the disappearance of missing money from a bank robbery case he had prosecuted about a year before his death. The reported sum of the missing cash was $36,000. You'll recall he was stabbed 36 times. When State Representative Mark Cohen heard the idea that Luna's death was anything other than a vicious murder, he wrote to the Justice Department asking for an independent investigation. Cohen's request for an independent investigation was denied. Quote, they don't want the public to look at this, Keisling said. Keisling also points out that Luna's car was equipped with an easy pass, but it was only used in the beginning of his mysterious trip that night. Why would a man with an easy pass start out using the device and then begin taking paper tickets? I did have one other thought about that. Uh, if he was going to potentially meet with someone and he didn't want it tracked later, uh, if this was possibly something that wasn't necessarily legal, um, maybe he wanted to make sure that his easy pass wasn't being tracked through, through those other stops, so he switched over to buying tickets. Um, I don't know, that's just another possibility if he was on his own. I'm just, I'm really not sure. It is, it is very weird that he would even start to use the easy pass if he was going on a trip like that. Over at abajournal.com, um, there's a little article written on this, and there was a section I didn't quite understand. He was prosecuting a drug case at the time of his death and was working on a plea deal after being accused of failing to reveal information about an FBI informant. Um, I did find some more details on this, heading over to Lancaster Online. So in that case that he was prosecuting, the chief witness, Warren Grace, was a convicted heroin dealer working as a paid FBI informant but Grace had broken the conditions of the confidential informant programs, slipping out of his electronic monitoring device and having heroin unrelated to the case in his vehicle, among other allegations. That information came out during the trial and defense attorneys accused Luna of failing to disclose it. Um, now, I know I mentioned the podcast before, uh, Case Files, Episode 9. Um, they really that whole podcast is written in a way where they're really thinking that this part of the case is key. That uh, this FBI informant being disclosed, not disclosed properly to the opposing counsel was possibly motivation for what happened to Jonathan Luna. And in their retelling of the story, which I didn't bump into this detail here, so I just, I'm putting a little asterisk around this. Um, they're saying that even the fact that this guy was an FBI informant was not disclosed to opposing counsel, which would be really, really bad. And apparently the judge was scolding uh, Jonathan Luna as well as the FBI for how they were handling things in this. So the book, The Midnight Ride of Jonathan Luna is available uh, on Amazon. I'll have a link to it down below just in case you're interested. The reviews uh, look pretty decent on it. There's, it seems like one person that really doesn't like it, but it seems like most people um, are liking that book. So there might be something to that that you want to check out. I'll also have a link to the Case File podcast, episode nine that I've mentioned down below. Um, just know that personally, I feel like there's a little bit too much of a story narrative written into this, and there is practically no citing of sources. So we have no idea where this information is coming from. It's an interesting listen. 
Um, just for me personally, I, I personally get a bit frustrated when I'm hearing information and I'm like, okay, where did they learn that? Because I want to go learn more about that. And you can't quite do that there, but um, you might enjoy it. There is also a Reddit thread on this as well as a Web Sleuth thread. Um, that isn't giant. I think it's only, looks like 160 entries on there. But if you're looking for more feedback and discussion on this case, you can check out those links in the description box below as well. So here's where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. What is going on with this case? The way that I see it, um, the big question is, was he alone or was someone with him? Was the pressure of what he was going through and trying to work out this plea agreement, um, did that finally crack him? Did that finally snap him in some way where he decided to do this to himself? Um, things that support that. I gotta say the weapon first of all. It just, it really, really hits me very, very odd that another person intending to harm him would use his own pen knife and just a pen knife in the first place. Once again, I wish we had better detail about, uh, you know, the autopsy information or things that were discovered by the investigators here, because I think we could tell. Uh, particularly if he was trying to hurt himself with that pen knife, his hands would probably have wounds from the knife blade closing on him during some of those stabbings, especially when you consider 36 stabbings. There's a pretty good chance that at some point that pen knife is going to fold. Um, outside of that, seeing everything that he was involved with, knowing the type of work that he was doing, I think it's certainly possible that someone might have tried to plan something and effectively do something to him. The big question at that point becomes, is it someone that is part of a criminal enterprise of some kind, or is it someone that's part of the justice system in some way? Um, the things that support that for me are really the lack of physical evidence that has come out about this case. It is practically unbelievable to me. For us to understand the time frame as much as we do, how many different opportunities there was for cameras to pick him up, people that he was interacting with. Um, there is just such little information that we can really kind of lean against and try to make a decision in this case. Um, outside of all that, I've seen theories about even, you know, a potential scorned lover, you know, him meeting up with someone uh, and then them taking the knife from him and doing something to him. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of theories out there, but quite honestly, I don't have one that really peaks out above the rest as being the one that I most believe in. Uh, and that tells me that I, I just I feel like we're not being given a whole lot of information in this case. And that is why I asked that question at the start of the episode, and I'll end it with the same question. Um, does law enforcement and the FBI, do they really want this case solved? To me, from what I'm seeing in terms of the information presented, it doesn't really seem like it. Of course, the FBI is offering a $100,000 reward if you're able to bring a conclusion to this case. So I just have to add that to the, to the mix of this conversation. Uh, is that really a true gesture or do they just feel confident that no one will solve this? I really don't know, guys. I don't know. And that's why the show is called Brain Scratch. So please use the comments below to discuss this case. If you find any different information or any interesting angles on it, share it with us. Um, be sure to include links if you can so that we can review the sources for ourselves. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Join me back here on Monday on the Lord and Arts channel. I'll see you there.